basically end the new year with the psalm. So we're going to be looking at Psalm 108. Kind of an interesting psalm because not much is written about it. Um, but you, when you kind of read Psalm 108, you'll see again, it's a familiar theme. It's always about military. It's always about, about preservation and war and things like that. And, and we're going to talk more as to why, why that's the case and, and, and why that's, that's relevant, why that's kind of a good thing. Uh, so Psalm 108, uh, it's really talking about the loyal love, the hesed, and the faithfulness of God, the emeth of God, hesed and emeth. So uh, yeah, at, at Psalm 108, I'll read it for us. This is, this is a psalm. It's a psalm of David. My heart is steadfast, O God. I will sing and make melody with all my being. Awake, O harp and lyre. I will awake the dawn. I will give thanks to you, O Yahweh, among the peoples. I will sing praises to you among the nations. For your steadfast love is great above the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth, that your beloved ones may be delivered. Give salvation by your right hand and answer me. God has promised in his holiness. With exultation, I will divide up Shechem and portion out the valley of Sukkoth. Gilead is mine, Manasseh is mine, Ephraim is my helmet, Judah my scepter. Moab is my wash basin, upon Edom I cast my shoe, over Felicia I shout in triumph. Who will bring me to the fortified city? Who will lead me to Edom? Have you not rejected us, O God? You do not go out, O God, with our armies. O grant us help against the foe, for vain is, is the salvation of man. With God, though, we shall do valiantly. It is he who will tread down our foes. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word and scripture, for your psalms that always give us pause to think about why people write what they do, why David would write what he does, why the, the sons of Korah write what they do, Lord Father God, why anyone would write uh, a, a song that they want people to know and to understand and to sing for for all the days of their lives, Lord Father God. We thank you for your word that it's that powerful, it makes us think that deeply. To understand the truths of you, to understand a person in their, in their situations in life, Lord Father God, um, just what a blessing it is to be able to uh, connect with, um, with writers of that era, Lord, that uh, make it so relevant even to us today. Uh, we thank you, Heavenly Father, for your graciousness towards us, Lord Father. May you open our minds to what you have to say to us uh, in Psalm 108 and how uh, it will lead us into this new year, Lord Father God, if you're willing to give this this new year, Father. We praise you and we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The interesting thing about Psalm 108 is uh, this is actually uh, one of your original mashups. Now, um, a mashup is kind of like a new term that, you know, I guess it's a... Uh, uh, generation X, or no, what, what is it, uh, millennial generation came up with, right, where they basically slam songs together and say, well, that's, that's a mashup, you know, they take two different songs, put it together, and, and, and it's something that uh, has been done before, but uh, it's just been called a different kind of name. And this is, this is an original mashup. Uh, Psalm 108 is actually two psalms put together, Psalm 57 and Psalm 60. And so you're saying to yourself, well, you have like Psalm 57 and Psalm 60, like what's, what's wrong with this, with this person? Why do you want to make a whole new psalm, you know, uh, to, teach, to teach to the nation? And it's like anything else in life. When we have mashups nowadays, uh, the one that comes to my mind is that Amazing Grace song where somebody has stuck in a bunch of verses and uh, changed the melody a little bit, you know, and made it, they're kind of like, quote unquote, half mashup. You know, that's just what people do. You know, they, they will take certain things, they, they take refrains, they take choruses, and they put them together, even though sometimes you're thinking, oh, they may, that may not really like belong together, but hey, the, the melody sounds nice, you know, and so we'll, we'll sing the songs, and, and people do it all the time. And it's, uh, uh, it's, it's very popular, like in secular music too. Uh, Noah and Jude are playing it all the time and things like that, say, oh, I recognize that song, and that song, and that song. Uh, and it's all together. So it's kind of neat, and it's kind of a, a, just a way of, of an author expressing to you the reason why I'm mashing these things together is because I'm taking certain elements of one thing and another thing and putting them together to tell you that either this is what I'm feeling at this moment, or these two parts of the song, not everything, is relevant to me, and, and this is what I want to tell somebody uh, uh, um, and, and, and make it known to them so that they will remember it. 
And so Psalm 108 is our uh, original mashup, and, and it's verses 1 through 6 that come from Psalm 57, and verses 7 through 13 that basically come from Psalm 60. Um, that this, this author is, is putting the, these verses together, and, and when we're looking at it, we see that what the author wants to emphasize in, in this case, in a new psalm called Psalm 108, uh, is a central theme, and the central theme is salvation, uh, always, of being saved. And especially salvation, uh, this author is writing about, that he's not talking about any kind of saving, but, but only the kind of salvation that's been given by God. Um, we, know, uh, <clears throat> we know people can be saved from a lot, or, or put it this way, you, you can be healthy uh, on the outside, but if you are, are sick on the inside, then you're really not healthy. And conversely, you can be healthy on the inside, but if your body doesn't perform well, you got some kind of atrophy or you're ailing or a broken arm or something, you're still not healthy. We know that a healthy person is always, it's, it's always one that's on the outside and it's always someone who's healthy on the inside. Um, that is a true healthy person. And very rarely are people both at the same time. Or they are, but it's usually for a short time, like, you know, when you're a baby. And then, you know, you grow up and you're like, oh, okay, you know, life is a little bit tougher than that. You know, um, but... Um, that, that pure state of health, when you are healthy on the inside and healthy on the outside, that's the Hebrew term. So, well, that's what we know as shalom, you know, peace. Okay, it, it doesn't necessarily mean, uh, uh, you know, how, how people have interpreted this in society nowadays is, oh, peace here, peace there. But a real state of shalom, I guess in, uh, in uh, Buddhism, they try to capture that same state, this, uh, this kind of like nothingness, you know. Um, this, this, this state of shalom is basically... I am satisfied on my inside, you know, uh, mentally, uh, emotionally, that kind of thing, and I'm also uh, healthy on, on the outside. Um, that perfect spot or that, that kind of um, place where everyone is always trying to get to, that's what's considered shalom. And that's, that's kind of what um, uh, the Old Testament especially is, is always trying to, to, to ask God for. So whenever you hear that word shalom, and that's actually the name of Jerusalem, it's, it's, it's uh, Yerushalom. Uh, the city of peace, uh, that's the name of it. Um, but <clears throat> that's, that's, uh, that's, that's what people are asking for. Uh, also, when they're asking for, for their salvation, it's not just, okay, save me from, from, my, from my enemies, but basically give me peace in, in all understandings of it so that I'm not fearful of someone, you know, like of leaving my garage door open and fearful that someone's going to break in, you know, steal my bike within five minutes. You know, that's not shalom. You know, that's San Francisco. Uh, but, you know, the, this is, shalom is, is basically, you know, like, I'm not worried about anything and, uh, and I feel good. That I could sleep under a tree, you know, that I could turn my sword into a plowshare because I'm not worried about society anymore. Um, that's a lot, oftentimes what the writers are asking God for. And, and in this case, it's, it's this kind of salvation that, that they want to be saved from, this kind of salvation that only comes from God. And we see that when salvation is talked about in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, salvation is always a literal concept. You know, it's always this sense of, of like, uh, save me on, on uh, um, the outside. That's, that's what's emphasized the most. You know, you'll find in the Old Testament, um, if you are wealthy, you're blessed by God. If you have a lot of children, you're blessed by God. If you have land, you're blessed by God. Because those are the promises of God. Land and children, um, that, that if you had those things in abundance, then you knew God was blessing you. Uh, a lot of that's going to change in the New Testament where a lot of things become spiritualized and, and a lot of, you know, your enemy is no longer like a Roman and your enemy is no longer like an Egyptian or a Moabite, but your enemy is sin. Okay, a lot of that kind of stuff gets kind of, kind of altered in, in the New Testament. But when you're reading the Old Testament, you have to understand that um, peace to them, to, to a Jew especially, was protection on the outside, okay, more so on the inside. Uh, I think that kind of changes a little bit in, in the New Testament, you know, where you're set free from sin, you know. Uh, but in, in the Old Testament times, a lot of the emphasis on the shalom is, is, is on the outside of a person. If I don't have people constantly harassing me with a sword, then, you know, life is good, right? Life is good. And in our psalm today, again, the salvation we see is from enemies. Um, it's always, you know, kind of like a war type scenario, you know, that, that, that the uh, psalmist is facing. Um, but it's, it's very comforting to me, always when I read the Old Testament, and, and probably why I like the Old Testament so much, uh, is, is because the Old Testament is always very tangible in the sense that you can grasp what that would feel like. 
You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's who, who doesn't want to be saved from an enemy? You know, if someone hates you and someone's trying to hurt you, you know, you can understand what salvation is in, in that context. You know, when someone says, my God is a rock, you know, I understand what that means because I see a rock, I see a cliff, and I see the strength of it, and I can understand, oh, that's what God is like. As opposed to saying, my God is omniscient. You know, what the heck does that mean? You know, I, I don't even know what an, you know, omniscient is. You know, I don't even know these, these vague concepts, but the Old Testament is always very tangible. You know, it's always very saying that if my God exists, you will see he exists because he's saving me from a physical enemy. And so uh, this is another one of the Psalms in, in which they're being saved. You know, he's asking God, save us from a physical enemy. Uh, show us that you are God. And in that way, that was proof enough to the people in the Old Testament that their God was real and, and, and God existed and, and God loved them. So, um, God, the neat thing about uh, the New Testament, obviously, is that things have been spiritualized. Salvation, for example, is salvation from eternal death, right? Because of our sins, you know, by, by repenting of our sins and believing in Jesus Christ. And, uh, um, and, and that's, that's kind of like a, a, the New Testament spin on things. But it's always good to know, uh, the Old Testament reminds us, that God cares about our physical well-being as well. And, and that's, that's nice to know, God, that God cares about what happens to us in our current daily lives right now. And this has caused many times to be thankful. You know, as, as far as I could find out when I was looking uh, through, through Psalm 108, in terms of just, you know, what, what people's comments uh, were on, on this, the kind of mashup of a text. Um, no one really seems sure why this psalm was particularly written, and no one was really sure why these two particular verses, why it was combined in, in, into one, why it, they took 57 and, and Psalm 60 and, and combined into one. No one's really sure, like, as to the background as, as, to, as to why that happened. But there are, 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 are two distinct parts to Psalm 108, and, um, and, and it hints that that Israel was going to go to war, Israel was going to go fight an enemy. It's either under King David or under somebody else. And I'm guessing it's probably under someone else, because King David would have, he's so creative, he probably would have written a whole new psalm, you know. Um, it's probably like under a new king. And uh, they were possibly going to go to war against Edom. And Edom, as you know, is uh, Esau, Esau's line. Um, so whoever this, this, this king is, or whoever this, the psalmist is, this writer is, uh, Israel is probably about to go to war with Edom, and therefore the, the psalmist is pleading with Yahweh to ensure victory. Uh, and we know the specialness of the psalms always is this, the psalms are national songs, right? The whole, all the people of Israel have to sing them. All the people of Israel have to know them. And so when, when they're teaching you a national song like we sing in the, in the U.S., we sing the national anthem, uh, if you're a citizen, you better know that. <laughs> you better know it. I don't care if you can hit the note or not, but you better know the words, and you better know how to sing it, and you better know what it means. Well, the Psalms function the same way. It gathered the people together. It was the main theological vehicle for the people to understand God, especially for those who couldn't read. And, and, and people uh, would get together, and they would sing this. And so this is what the psalmist is trying to tell them, that he's pleading with Yahweh to ensure victory. And we kind of get a sense of this in Psalm, chapter one, in Psalm 108, uh, verse 13 where the psalmist writes, with God, only with God, we shall do valiantly, because it is God who is the one who treads down our foes. Yes, we may be fighting, but it is God who really causes the defeat of an enemy. And the attitude of, of the psalmist is instructive for us, um, because the psalmist demonstrates complete reliance on God in, in all aspects of his life. You know, uh, which, which sometimes we have a hard time doing. I think Rosalind was just praying about it. You know, like sometimes we think about this next new year, like, okay, this is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm going to do. What does the Bible teach us about that, <laughs> especially in the book of James? Right? The Bible teaches us, don't count your chickens before they're hatched. You don't know whether you're going to get the next week, you know, uh, to live or not. Okay? You always have to live in this kind of like a, yes, on the one hand, I have to plan for the future, but on the other hand, I've got to kind of uh, uh, let God do his thing, right? Uh, because I'm not God, and God has a plan for, for, for what each of us are going to be doing. And so, and so you're kind of always kind of living in, in, in this tension. And so the attitude of the psalmist is to do the same thing and, and to say to the people, yes, we must go to war, because either we started the war, you know, or they're, they're, they're starting war with us. But at the same time, we've got to fight under Yahweh. Okay? And it's only Yahweh that's going to assure us the victory.
So the first thing the psalmist does is he worships God. And he worships, uh, he, he, the way the psalmist says is, is, is that when you worship God, I want you to worship. Or he says, at least I'm going to worship at a time when people are still sleeping. I will worship God in darkness before the dawn. And that's a neat thing that, that he, tells, he tells us, he instructs us, he instructs the people in Psalm 108 verses 1 to 2. He says, my heart is steadfast, you know, my heart is loyal, my heart is steady, um, O God. I will sing and I will make melody with all of my being. Awake, O harp and lyre. You know, this guy's a musician. And he says, I will awake the dawn. The psalmist, he doesn't care who he wakes up. He, he doesn't care that it's a, and the point is to actually wake people up, and he wants to wake people up with worship music. He wants people to listen to his, his worship songs. Um, he, the psalmist does not intend for his worship to be silent. You know, unlike most of us, you know, we're scared to, you know, go out in public to a restaurant. We're scared to pray out loud, right, for our meal. Like, don't sing, just say a quick prayer. Thank God, thank you for the food. You know, like that, right? We won't even sing, like, Praise God from whom all blessings flow. You know, we won't do that kind of stuff because we just don't want the people next to us hearing us, right? And this guy is, well, yeah, you know, before the, before the roosters come, you know, you know and, and, you know, start, you know, you know um, cuckooing or whatever, you know, I'm going to get up and I'm, and I'm going to praise God and I'm going to sing and I'm going to sing loud. And, and the psalmist um, does not intend for the worship to be silent, but uh, this psalmist wants it to go out so that everybody can hear him. Psalm 108, uh, verse 3. And, and what he's going to say is, I will give thanks to you, O Yahweh, among the peoples. I will sing praises to you among the nations. The psalmist has public worship before the dawn, and, and before the dawn, it's meant for two people groups, meaning it's meant for everybody. It's meant for among the peoples, that means Israel, you know, I will sing the songs for my own people because my own people will understand this. But, you know, when I sing and when I sing loud, I'm going to sing also for the nations too, uh, the outreach, right, for everyone else. I don't care if you're a believer or non-believer. I'm going to declare who is great in this life before the dawn. I'm going to wake you up because I know you, you, you know, Edom, whoever is my enemy, you're probably camped outside my city, you know. So before the dawn breaks, I'm going to be singing, you know, to wake you guys up too and to tell you how good Yahweh is. He's going to do this by song, right? He's like, that's not how you start off a war. You start off a war with a flaming arrow, man. You don't start off, you know, before the dawn singing songs, right? But this is what he's teaching the people. You want to start the day right? You want to start, you know, a war right? You praise God and you get up early to do it and you sing loud and you don't care who listens to it. You want them all to hear what you have to say. And the reason why, the reason why this psalmist is bold enough to wake up the neighborhood you know, he, he's bold enough to wake up the neighborhood with, with worship and singing is because this psalmist is bragging. He's bragging about who God is. He's bragging about his God, and he's bragging about how God already has demonstrated tangible actions in terms of helping his people. That's what he's really bragging about. You know, this song is not a, a song about himself, you know, a hero worship song where I am so great and the tallest, and I'm going to beat you up if you try and come to my city. But it's about his God, and it's about how this God has, has protected his people all these years, ever since Abraham to Egypt to, to you know, now coming back to the promised land, how this God continues to protect his people. And it's all about the, the goodness of God, that God's love and God's faithfulness, they're so great, they're so bountiful, that they have overfilled the earth. I mean, they, they've completely filled the earth so much that there's nowhere else to go uh, for God's love but, but to just go up, all the way up to the heavens. Right? Psalm 108, verses 4 to 5. You know, the psalmist says, The reason why I sing is because your steadfast love, you know, your hesed, Heavenly Father, is great above the heavens. You know, it's, 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 <laughs> it's there. Your faithfulness, your emeth, and that's where we get the word uh, amen from. It means faithfulness. And your emeth, it reaches to the clouds. You know, it's already covered on the earth, it, and it's just going up because it's so great. Your, my cup overflows, you know, the earth overflows because of how great you are. So therefore, be exalted, O God, above the heavens. I know you're there, Lord, and let your glory be over all the earth. It's over the earth. <laughs> it's in the heavens. We can see it. It's obvious. Because we have seen you time and time again save your people. You have saved us. And so we know. We know. 
How has God demonstrated his love and faithfulness? Yahweh has literally saved his people from being killed by their enemies. That's how I know. He cares about what happens to me. Psalm 108, verse 6. That your beloved ones may be delivered. Give salvation by your right hand and answer me, O Yahweh. We know it only comes from you. We know it only comes from you. We could, we could win a battle. You know, we, we could, we could, we could uh, win a war against, you know, and, and build our wall, you know, uh, to, to separate, you know, immigrants. We, we can do that, you know, but, and, and we, we could destroy Russia, and we could destroy China in the process. We could economically kill them, too. But sometimes, you know, when you don't feel good on the end, you know, you, you won a battle, but you don't feel good on the inside. It was basically like a hollow victory. And so what this guy is asking for, what the Psalms is asking for is, is make this a full victory. You have saved us. You know, you will give us that peace once again. You know, and that's what we look forward to because all of our lives, everything, everything we know in our history shows us, Lord, that you've always been walking with us and you've always saved us. So our nation, even though it's so small, it's here even now. Hundreds of years, ever since the time of Egypt, even now, even in the 21st century, Israel is still around. How is that possible? Right? Except for the hand of God. And taking a cue a couple weeks ago uh, uh, from Samuel's good, goodbye speech in 1 Samuel chapter 12, the psalmist, he reminds the people and the Israeli soldiers about Yahweh's promise to protect his people from those who would seek to do them harm. Right? Uh, <clears throat> the way, the way Samuel has, had encouraged the people, remember he said, you know, do you know how God has been faithful to you guys? And he showed them the map. Remember in, in Psalm chapter 12, verse 1, Samuel said, uh, uh, remember, remember uh, Ammon and uh, Moab and um, Edom. Edom is like right around here or something. Remember Samuel was saying, Samuel's up here and saying, remember how God has preserved you from uh, the, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Edomites, the Philistines, how God has, has how your enemies have literally surrounded you and, and should have crushed you at any time, but for whatever reason, God has always preserved you ever since that time. Well, now you're talking about, I don't know, uh, um, years later in David's time, you know, he still kind of lived in the time of, 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 of Samuel, uh, where the psalmist is reminding them again, we still have our enemies, they're still here. Ammon, Ammon, uh, Ammon is, um, that's Lot's kid, Lot's, Lot's, Young, uh, younger son from the incestual relationship. Moab is there. Um, Moab is the older, the older son from Lot. And uh, Edom is Esau. You know, he, their enemies and the Philistines are, yeah, they're just the Philistines. You know, they got, they're just a, a cool coastal people that, you know, mess around with iron. They were one of the first ones to discover iron weapons, you know. Um, so Samuel was saying, those guys, all your enemies are always around you, Israel, and you're, you, know, you, you have survived to this day. And so the psalmist is, is taking a cue from, um, from Samuel's speech, and he's saying, this is, you know, this is, this is how Yahweh has preserved us. In, in Psalm 108, verse 7 and 9, God has promised in His holiness, with exultation, I will divide up Shechem and portion out the valley of Sukkoth, Gilead is mine, Manasseh is mine, Ephraim is mine, uh, Ephraim is my helmet, and Judah is my scepter. And he's talking about these areas where you have Manasseh, there's two of them. There's the east, uh, uh, east Manasseh and west Manasseh. Uh, Gilead is this region right over here. Sukkoth is uh, right here. Gilead is right here. Uh, what the Lord is saying is, I know what is going on in your cities. I know what is going on in your territories. I'm protecting them. And at the same time, God is saying, also, Moab right here, you're my wash basin. You know, uh, Edom, I cast my shoes. I throw my shoes over here on Edom. Felicia, you know, you guys think you're so strong, but I shout in triumph over you. That, that the psalmist is reminding his people that, hey, God is already basically, uh, um, God has ownership over all the nations. Yahweh owns all the, all the territories of Shechem, Sukkoth, Gilead, Manasseh, Ephraim, Judah. You know, Yahweh is also asserting his dominance. You know, your God is also asserting his dominance over the nations by designating statuses to them. You know, in, in relation to his children, he calls Moab. He calls the you know, the wash basin. You know, he calls Edom. That's the place where I put my shoes. You know, he calls Felicia. You know, the coastal lands. He says you are you are defeated even though you are, are great with like iron weapons. You were know, the first to discover or to use iron in warfare. He's like, you guys are nothing to me. That God has already kind of determined you know, uh, the, the fate of these people. 
And so the psalmist is saying, therefore, God, because you have already said these things, um, you, you know, uh, and especially Edom, since you have already uh, designated Edom as a place to put your shoes, the psalmist is reminding the people, and he's also making a plea before God, saying, do not allow Edom to have any glory over us in battle, Lord. You know what you said about Edom. That's the place where you put your shoes. Don't let them have glory in defeating your people, Israel. The psalmist insists that the real salvation can only come from the hand of God. It cannot come by man's hand, no matter how good man is, no matter how innovative man is. Oh, we got fireball catapults, you know. Uh, we got, you know, this and that. We got ramming. Doesn't matter how, how, how creative people are. Uh, the psalmist realizes, he understands, he's telling the people, but real salvation actually comes from the hand of God. When God defeats somebody, you know, you're not going to get up again, you know. Um, but if man does it, you do it on your own power, you know, it may or may not work. And so the 100% the sure bet is always God. So Psalm 108, verses 10 to 12. He says, who will bring me to the fortified city? Who is going to lead me to Edom? Have you not rejected us, O God? You do not go out with our armies. It doesn't feel like you're with us, Lord. So, verse 12, grant us help against the foe, because vain is the salvation of man. You know, you can't trust in, in mankind, but we can only trust in you, Lord. It feels sometimes, Lord, when we have to go out to battle, that you're not with us. You know, and, and, and you know, what, what, why, why would you allow us to exist in a place just, just to kill us later on, Lord? You, you promised to lead us out. You already designated that these places were not going to have triumph over us. Please remember that, O Lord. Go with us. Go out to war with us. Grant us help against the foe. Because vain is the salvation of man. We can't affect our own saving. We can't affect our own salvation. And so you hear this Psalm 108, and you're looking at me going, okay, Jerome, so what, right? Well, what is the implication for us today? Are you or are you not in a similar battle? You think you're at war? What do we talk about? We're in the time of Samuel. You think there's no war going on around you? It's spiritual, just as it was with the people. Just because this is physical and we, we're, we're dealing with spiritual wars right now that are actually turning physical. Okay? We are in the same state. This is why it's important to read these Psalms every now and then to remind us that who we have to trust in when we are, are need, need to go to war. The implication for us today is that we need to have the same confidence in Yahweh that the psalmist had. Because even, you know, and even if we go through pain and suffering, you know, what we need to understand is God is not ultimately going to let us be destroyed by what's been happening around us uh, since we are God's children through salvation in His Son, Jesus Christ. And we know we're children because Romans chapter 8, verse 16 says, The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Guys, we talked a few weeks ago that, you know, it, it, on the one hand, you want to say, yeah, God is, God is loving, God is this, God is that, you know, but Israel still had to go to war. They still had to fight. And we found out why, because we read the book of Judges, and the Judges, book of Judges told us why every, every generation is going, to, is going to have to experience a war, you know. No questions asked. You have to. Um, so we know why we have to go to war. And, the pro and, the reason, and, and basically the reason why is so that every generation will learn how to trust in God. Right? Because you can't trust in God if you never have experienced any, any, anything going on in life. Right? So, so every generation has to go to war, even the Christian generations even now. That if Christ had to go to war, right, we also have to go to war. We have to be prepared for war. You know, whether, whether you like to or not, whether you think you're going to engage in it or not. You can hide your head in the sand, but eventually you're going to have to figure out whether you're going to confess your faith or not to people. So we are in the same situation. So we know that, we know that suffering in this world is, is inevitable, inevitable because of sin. And, and like Israel, we all need to go to war. But the great gift of the psalmist is he brings us through the, the, the psalm, the, he brings us the psalm and gives us confidence and he gives us hope that God is keeping his promise to save his people and that this is why we must give thanks to God always and to reflect on God's faithfulness for us in the past year. Always take time to reflect that even in the midst of battles and the wars that, you know, sometimes I don't even want to fight, Lord. It's, it's just tiring, you know. You got to go to battle again, man. Edom's coming. 
Okay, and when Edom's done, Ammon's coming after you. Oh, when that's done, oh, Felicia wants to start a fight with you. Sometimes you'll say, I'm tired of this. I don't want to keep battling this. And yet sometimes this is just the way it is, right? So what keeps you going is the psalmist's kind of uh, encouragement to say to you, God is with you, that if you are his child, the promise is that he will protect you because he's already designated things uh, that are going to happen. And so you need to, we need to have faith in him. So this past year, you know, you think about the year 2018, just like all the other past years, you know, we've had our shares of, of tragedy. We've had our shares of trials. You, you see Asia Bibi, right? Uh, the one in Pakistan who's being uh, persecuted by the Muslims. Uh, she won her court case, but she can't get out of Pakistan right now because the, uh, the Muslims want to kill her. So she steps out of prison. You know, they're going to kill her. Uh, so she's still stuck in prison. The safest place for her right now is still in prison after nine years. So she's still in Pakistan. Uh, you have Isabel Chow, right, who um, Kelvin told me the other day, and I verified it too. She has now been kicked off of the, the Berkeley Senate Council for her views on gay marriage. You know, because Berkeley is not one of the most open-minded places in the world. You've got to understand that. You go to Berkeley, it's one of the most narrow-minded places in the world. All, all research institutions are because of the arrogance of people, okay? So they kicked her out because of her views on, on, on gay marriage. And we have uh, Jack Phillips over there, who's the, uh, the baker in Colorado, right? He won his court case with the Supreme Court that he doesn't have to bake a cake for, uh, for gay couples, but now a transgender uh, woman is suing him because he won't bake a cake for her. Right? So he's now in a lawsuit all over again in Colorado. It doesn't end. Right? He's like, oh, man, when is this going to end? So uh, they're trying to bankrupt him, basically, and uh, they force him to quit, quit baking cakes. Right? So you have things like, we have things like that going on. Um, we also had notable people who died you know, uh, uh, this past year in 2018. Uh, you know, take your pick. Some people are crying about Stan Lee. Some people are crying about Stephen Hawking. You know, I, I, you know, there, there's other people uh, that, have, that have died. Next. And we have other notable events that happen. You know, we had, we've had severe floodings, whether you live in Carolina or whether you live in, in certain parts of Florida. You had horrendous weather patterns. You know, that was the East Coast. I, you guys are going to school on the East Coast. That was probably you. You, know, you remember that. Just the snow coming out of the, the, the weather systems like crazy. We've had terrorisms and mass shootings, right? Stoneman Douglas, you know, and this is just a school, man. You think one of the safest places would be school? Not anymore, right? And you have, a, we just had a, a mass, uh, what, bombing on a bus in Egypt, a tour bus in Egypt, uh, targeting Christians, I think, you know, uh, that are just going, going on. And, and we have terrorism and mass shootings. We had a lot of sexual assaults this, this year, you know, where husbands were literally high-profile cases where husbands were killing their wives in order to marry their girlfriends. You know, um, you had a, a, a lot of, um, that's what Ali Reisman's there for. You had a lot of uh, fires go on. Uh, you remember this? This is what we're collecting money for. <laughs> it's such an ironic name, you know, campfire. That's not what. That's not, not what it was. It's an inferno, you know. Um, you have, you have people losing their houses. Um, you have we have a government shutdown, which some people are not going to get paid for the next few weeks until a, a border wall is going to be built. You, know, you have a stock market crash where everyone is flying high and saying, "Yeah, you know, we we made money," and you know, yeah, I, I was part of it too. I lost twenty thousand dollars within two weeks, right? You know, uh, you have uh, this lady. I, this is she was new, um, Bree Bree Payton. Uh, what I highlighted was she's twenty six years old. She died a couple days ago from meningitis, the swine flu, right? Because apparently, <laughs> young adults are very susceptible to it. Okay, twenty six years old. Right? You kill our young adults, man, that's like killing a future generation. You know, young kids. And so she's 26. You have swine flu going on, and, and you had a adenovirus going on at University of Maryland. You know, we had resp people had respiratory problems due to bacteria. You think universities are safe? They're not safe, man. <laughs> you, know, you, better, you better check where you go to school, you know. Um, you, you, we have all of this going on, and, and you know, it's, it's just relentless. But our reality is this. For you, for me, because I'm looking at everyone here, that despite all of these things that have been happening, we're still here. God has still allowed us time to meet together right here, right now. And while it's inevitable that I'm sure you know someone who knows someone who knows someone that has been hit by some of these tragedies, you know, you know people who have died you know, in, in the worst ways. Uh, you know people who have, have suffered you know, from weather patterns. You know people who are persecuted. While 
you know someone who has faced these tragedies mentioned above, by and large, you and me, we have been spared from this for this past year. This just happened all in the past year, and that's just, a, that's just part of the news, right? <laughs> you should see my slideshow, but it's like long. As I had pictures you know, of all these things. It's like uh, too much to mention. And yet we're still here. We, I, I, I don't know, how many of you suffered a burned house? Did you guys have to restart your lives over? I didn't. But some people have. And so this is the reason to reflect on this past year, to thank God for His salvation while we still have today. So as we go to time of meditation and prayer, as we go to time of meditation and prayer, um, we want to contemplate the confidence that the psalmist had in God to save him from his enemies. You know, our enemies nowadays are, you know, they can be... Um, People persecuting us as, as, as Christians, that's true. Uh, but we also, are, our enemies are also spiritual in nature as well, too, as, as well as, you know, just natural disasters happening left and right and, and just general fear of, like, diseases and outbreaks and that kind of stuff. <clears throat> we, when we go to time of meditation and prayer, we need to con contemplate the confidence that the psalmist still had in God. He said to God, even in the midst of all of these things, you know, you, God, if you save us from our enemies, then we will truly be saved. And that's the confidence that we want to have uh, from our God as well. Um, any scheme from men, you know, that we try to fix our own problems, you know, we oftentimes, you know, uh, it may or may not um, result in a good, good thing. You know, we may, we may fall, we, we may not fall. But when it comes from God, it's always certain. So as we go to a time of meditation and prayer, we want to remember the Psalm 108, 12 to 13, where the psalmist emphasizes to the people, this is what you pray to God. And you say, O oh God, grant us help against the foe, because vain is, is the salvation of man. Only with God we shall do valiantly. It is God who will tread down our foes. So as you go to time of, of, a time of um, silent meditation, um, we also want to be a people I also want to invite you as a people, as a congregation, to wake the dawn, too. And, and so we're going to go to a time of, 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 of meditation and, and silent prayer, but also we're going to give all of us a time of open testimony, too, of open prayer within the congregation to thank God uh, for his salvation, uh, that for what he's done for you, for what he's done for us on behalf of, of, of this past year. So take a moment of time to just think about the good things God has done for us this year, God has done for you this year, and we'll save some time also for congregational praise uh, too as well. So let's go to time of prayer.